welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants will be on a listen-only mode for the duration of today's conference. This call is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect at this time. And we'll now turn the call over to Wendy Peebles. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, operator. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy Peebles, Lead Outreach Coordinator, Census Bureau Economic Management Division. The Census team is happy to host the second of a five-part webinar series in celebrating Manufacturing Month this year. Thank you all for joining today. We have an informative webinar plan along with our trade promotion partners to include U.S. Commercial Service, XM Bank, MAP National Network, Small Business Administration, and the Census Bureau. You will hear from several of our the partnership agencies today to bring you valuable information on manufacturers and federal agency resources to increase global business opportunities. The webinar is being recorded and the question and answer period will occur at the end of today's webinar via the chat. Please submit questions to all panelists. The presenters will address as many questions as possible during the webinar. The contact information will be provided for further follow-up. A few weeks following the webinar, the transcript recording and presentation will be posted to the Census Academy site, and that link will be provided in the chat, or you may find it from where you registered from today's event. We ask that you please complete the evaluation at the end that assists us in planning future events. As a reminder, join us for the remaining Thursdays in October at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we will feature a topic in celebration of manufacturers around the country to help you grow your businesses to include financing, credit insurance, supply chain, and the last webinar will be presented in Spanish with Hispanic-owned manufacturers sharing their success stories to close out the series. You can also obtain that information from where you registered from for today. Oh, let's see. Let's take a look at our agenda. And once again, having a little technical glitch here. Here we go. All right, we will have welcome remarks by our special guest, Bailey DeRees, Associate Administrator, Office of Investment and Innovation, U.S. Small Business Administration. We will have our business roundtable moderated by Pam Plagens, Advanced Manufacturing Team Leader, U.S. Commercial Service, U.S. Department of Commerce. And for our agency forum, we will offer programs and services for early stage manufacturers. The agencies will cover how to gain access to additional markets, help you be more competitive in the marketplace, and provide you with some networking opportunities with various industries. And those agencies will be SBA, MEP National Network, U.S. Commercial Service. At the end, we will have our audience um, Q&A session. So at this time, I would like to introduce our special guest, Bailey DeReese. Bailey DeReese is SBA's Hi, Associate Administrator. Administrator. Yes, let me just, just read a brief bio, and then I'm going to turn it over to you for Thank the opening you. remarks. My apologies. Bailey DeReese is SBA's Associate Administrator for the Office of Investment and Innovation. Previously, Ms. DeReese served as venture partner at Trail Mix Ventures, where she dedicated her time to financially inclusive seed stage investments and has served in executive roles with Green Springs Associates, T. Rowe Price Associates, and Soterra Defense Solutions. She has over 17 years of combined experience in business strategy, asset management, government contracting, and investments. She attended Wake Forest University, Northwestern University, and Georgetown University, and is an Illinois native. Welcome, Associate Administrator DeReese, and thank you for joining today. You may want to come off mute. Uh, hi, Wendy. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I uh, wish we could be in person, but this is just wonderful that we're able to kick off uh, this wonderful event. And thank you so much um, for joining the webinar on early stage manufacturing. Um, I am just delighted to be here uh, speaking with this wonderful audience. Your success is our goal. 
And Manufacturing Month is just a terrific opportunity to appreciate the work of businesses like yours and be sure that you know about the federal resources that are here to help you grow and thrive. As we celebrate manufacturers, uh, please know that uh, you are part of something so much bigger than your own business, and we are uh, grateful to be part of the ecosystem that is supporting manufacturers in the U.S. Your success is important to the health and the prosperity of the U.S. economy as a whole. And I think that uh, individuals across the country, across industries, are very well aware of how critical manufacturing is. Um, in light of the pandemic, we have felt uh, the importance and need uh, for support for our manufacturing capabilities domestically. Um, so you are the job creators, you are the makers of uh, so much that will help us build back better as we continue to recover from the global pandemic. Um, as you move from the idea of, uh, how do I put this, the phase of development and research on to commercialization um, and hopefully uh, to global growth as an exporter, our office, the Office of Investment and Innovation, along with the rest of the U.S. Small Business, uh, Small Business Administration and other federal agencies you'll get to know about today, we stand here to help you so that you can play a valuable role in our nation's economy um, and global competitiveness. So just in the last month, I'll share with you that we have awarded $5.4 million the Office of Investment and Innovation to 92 growth accelerators that are helping to scale high-tech startups, uh, many of which are focused on manufacturing. Uh, our office is also responsible uh, for what we very fondly call America's seed fund. So what is this? Um, so you might be familiar with the Small Business Innovation Research and Tech Transfer Program. These are the resources that are pulled together across 11 agencies of the federal government uh, to be there to support uh, the growth of initial ideas um, early on in the research and concept phase. So that way uh, entrepreneurs have the capital and resources to help nurture these ideas um, as they progress all the way through to commercialization. So the Small Business Innovation Research Program, the SBIR program, and the Small Business Technology Transfer Program, as I just mentioned, you know, we fondly call them American Seed Fund, uh, they provide over $3.5 billion in non-dilutive capital every year to our nation's most promising entrepreneurs. These innovative entrepreneurs and their growing businesses uh, can all be found on sbir.gov. I have to give my plug for that. So if you haven't uh, checked it out, I certainly would encourage um, visiting to learn more about uh, the types of uh, awards that are provided and the companies that have uh, applied for these awards and successfully moved through. Um, you can also find resources here on local support organizations um, that can roll up their sleeves and help you grow your innovative small business ideas and concepts uh, to potentially move forward with becoming an SBIR, STTR awardee. Uh, beyond that, our team at the Office of Investment and Innovation is also hard at work building networks to support entrepreneurs um, and helping to cultivate relationships with support organizations to lessen the barriers to commercialization. So that way, more entrepreneurs across every corner of the country have opportunity to access the benefits of the programs that we offer to help cultivate innovative ideas that can grow and accelerate um, our progress in manufacturing. So we'd encourage you to uh, check out the broader website uh, for the Office of Inve Investment and Innovation on the SBA website uh, to learn more about our programs and reach out at any time. Um, but beyond that, uh, I'd love to share that in my position that I am so honored to have within the Biden administration, um, I've seen that despite the pandemic um, and the challenges that businesses have faced, there are global trends that present opportunities to accelerate and support the growth of businesses like yours. Technologies like 3D printing, e-commerce, 
blockchain, artificial intelligence, and 5G are enabling small businesses to make products and offer services and sell to new customers in so many different ways. There are digital innovations that are reducing the costs associated with exporting and streamlining operations. And global online purchasers are increasing to the norm uh, with 2.14 billion customers buying online and three of four U.S. small businesses having increased their use of digital tools. The U.S. Small Business Administration is just one of the agencies that you'll hear from today. But please know that we are here to help. And in fiscal year 2020 alone, we partnered to help more than 70,000 small manufacturers gain more than $32 billion in federal contracts, financial assistance, and counseling or support. This is roughly one-third of small manufacturers in the country. We are here to help. And we offer a great deal of support to help small businesses export as well. And you might ask why we do this? Well, because exporters enjoy twice the sales of non-exporters and hire three times more employees than staying in business um, and stay in business 10 years longer. We are here to help. We want to support job growth, economic opportunity, and support the small business manufacturers located across every corner of the country. We hope you enjoy the webinar and thank you so much. Great. Thank you for those remarks. You certainly have set the stage for today's webinar, and thanks for sharing the information and all the services that your agency provides. At this time, we are preparing for our roundtable um, discussion with our businesses, and I would like to turn it over to Pam Plagens to begin our discussion. Thanks, Wendy. I'm Pam, I'm Pam Plagens. I'm the Advanced Manufacturing Team team leader for the U.S. Commercial Service, the trade and investment promotion arm of the U.S. Department of Commerce International Trade Administration. I'm really pleased to join you today as we celebrate Manufacturing Month 2021. I'm excited to moderate this panel, particularly of early stage manufacturers and their success stories that you'll hear today. Manufacturing is the engine that drives our economy and a high priority for the federal agencies coordinating this celebration. Today, we'll explore the idea phase, commercialization, and global growth journey of early stage manufacturers. Hearing from two small business executives and serial entrepreneurs who have effectively tapped federal government resources to help identify export markets and international customers. Before we jump into questions, however, and the discussion, I'd like to briefly introduce them and then we'll uh, let them introduce themselves a little bit. But in the meantime, you can check out um, more information on the slide. Our first speaker is Anthony Mulligan. He's the CEO of Hydronalix, um, based in Green Valley, Arizona. Hydronalix is a small technology company specializing in extreme performance, small unmanned vehicles, both for water and air. Founded in 2009, the company has grown to be internationally recognized as the world's leader in robotic water rescue systems and advanced small unmanned surface vehicles. As you'll see from the slides, they sell into 33 countries around the world. Pretty impressive. Uh, Tony has served on the Defense um, Science Board, Manufacturing Task Force, and the REV Arizona Board, which is part of the Arizona Commercial Commerce Authority and funded by NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership. He's also participated in the Export Tech Program and received an Export Achievement Certificate in 2019. If you want to learn more about Tony's export, export, exporting expertise, Later, please tune into a recent episode of the Commercial Services Export Nation podcast, where he and TMA Blue Tech founder Michael Jones discuss successful, successful exporting practices. All right, next, um, as Samantha Snades is uh, the founder and catalyst for RE3D. She's a reservist in the Air National Guard. With RE3D, she facilitates the connection between other print others printing at the human scale and or used recycled materials to access locally dri driven manufacturing in 50 countries. As a bootstrapped open source social enterprise led by women who manufacture in USA, um, RE3D has received many awards along the way. Samantha currently volunteers as the immediate past global chair of IEEE's entrepreneurship. Previously, she served as a social entrepreneur in residence for the NASA headquarters and deputy strategist supporting NASA JSC, Johnson Space Center, down here in Houston, um, Life Sciences Directorate, after selling a startup for DARPA-funded co-patented tissue culture device. 
Well, thank you for joining us today. And I am awed by both of your accomplishments, so I'm really excited to hear a bit more. Um, I have a few questions for you, but before we jump in, as I said, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourselves uh, and your company. And why don't we get started with Tony, and then we'll go to Samantha. Hi, um, thanks for having me. I'm Tony Mulligan. I'm the CEO of Hydronolics. Um, and the, uh, we're about 12 years old, but we're about nine years as a functioning um, manufacturing company. Uh, this is my fourth manufacturing company that I founded or helped start. Uh, my first one was while I was in college. And uh, the, uh, by the time I, my last year in mechanical engineering, we were manufacturing medical reacher devices for people with developmental disabilities. Um, the, uh, my manufacturing experience is also varied to uh, computer components, uh, which were heavily exported and also a company that manufactured pet products that used to be purchased in PetSmart, Kmart, and major department stores uh, around the country and around the world. Um, and now I build robotic boats, which is a, a similar spinoff to, uh, I used to build robotic airplanes. And uh, so the, the plan here was take everything that's used in a, a UAV, all that hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars the government spent and use that technology for small boats. Um, and our, our first fun invention uh, basically started in spring of 2010, and that's the uh, Emily Rescue Line. Well, I was pretty impressed by watching the video of uh, Emily, so uh, hopefully others will have a chance to take a look at that. Um, Samantha, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and uh, Re3D? Sure, thank you guys so much for having me today. And apologies for the dog barking in the background. I had to take my dog to A&M Small Business Vet Clinic this morning. <laughs> uh, this is the life of an entrepreneur. Um, but for context, we are a spin-off of Engineers Without Borders, NASA Johnson Space Center. And uh, the time that I spent there, uh, meeting my co-founder and getting to know some of our teammates um, after selling my first company. Um, basically, we're about 10 years old. We originally were a club with Engineers Without Borders and within NASA. And um, we had this vision after traveling to Rwanda, Nicaragua, and Mexico to make a large, affordable 3D printer, so the size of a toilet and bigger, to make functional objects that could someday be powered by waste. So we started sharing this online in blogs and uh, worked our way into some contests and, and got some money from the government of Chile to, to quit our jobs at NASA and trying to make it happen. So. This is Gigabot, which we launched live at the Startup TLA booth at South by Southwest in 2013. Um, and it was funded in one day, actually 27 hours, which instantly put us into 23 countries. And what we learned is people around the world are problem solvers. So we started bootstrapping our, our company. It is an open source design. Um, and we give one away for every 100 we deliver to someone trying to make a difference in their community. But along the way, we, uh, we realized that we wanted to go a step further and empower the printer to print from garbage. Um, so by using resources from U.S. Commerce, SBA, and particularly the FDIR program and the National Science Foundation, we were able to make that happen. It took about $2.5 million thanks to America's Seed Fund, but this is Gigabot X. It is being sold in beta. It's already been delivered across three continents, and people are continuing to request bigger and bigger versions of it as we grind up plastic waste and use pellets uh, to print directly from trash. Wow, thank you, Samantha. You know, Samantha, I remember when I first met your company, um, I met you before this, but I saw your company at HUSETEX. It was a trade show that was taking place this week in Houston. So I uh, kind of feel like it's full circle. Well, I'm going to go to the next question. And thank you for being a trooper and, and, and uh, multitasking for us today. Um, I'm going to, I'll let Tony uh, field this, the first uh, round of this, and then we'll go to you, Samantha. So talk a little, Tony, talk a little bit about the idea stage for developing your technology, and then we'll go to Samantha with the same question. So um, we, uh, our idea for making a rescue boat came while we were building uh, simple camera boats to look at animals in the water. And during the storm, we realized that um, if we put a little a float, like a life jacket, 
we could get to anybody in the ocean, no matter how bad the storm was. And uh, so that was sort of the, the gelling of the idea. Um, there were two of us, my partner, Bob Lautrup and I. And so what we did on this concept very quickly was we acted very fast on actually building a prototype of the idea. So I would say within 10 days, we had a, a prototype of this idea running on the ocean and we we're able to uh, coordinate that with the lifeguards in Los Angeles County who were always interested in new things. And the jumping on it right away, um, there's a bunch of things, a bunch of different ideas happen and develop quickly. Um, but a lot of times your first gut re reactions to a concept are the best ones. And so before we got worried about with all our perceived problems of why it wouldn't work, we just jumped right into it. Um, the other part of the idea that development that was important was when we decided, okay, if this was gonna be something we're gonna manufacture, how do we do the design based around a known supply chain that we already had in place from previous businesses and previous people we knew? So the actual design was incorporated around the strength of people that that we had a strong relationship with. Uh, the sewing entities, the machine shop entities, the composites fabrication entities. And we designed it to meet their strengths. Um, this also gave us a chance to incorporate a loyal group of people that we didn't have to worry about trade secrets going out and stuff because we'd had so much business with them in the past. And we also decided that we wanted the design to be something that we could produce in uh, rural America. And we picked a location in Southern Arizona, which is very far from the ocean, <laughs> but um, it gives us a very stable manufacturing base and um, also helped us stay safe for a number of years without potential competitors finding out what we're doing. I like that, that you're not very close to the ocean, but you're, you've got an ocean solution. Yeah. Well, we have lots of beaches here, but we just don't have any water for them in Arizona. We have plenty. <laughs> Samantha, I'll uh, hand, the, hand the, the baton to you. I think there's a country music song about lack of oceans in Arizona or something, but John, I, or <laughs> Tony, I love everything that you're doing. Um, yeah, so for us, you know, we are um, community driven and at our core, as I shared. So, you know, really, um, if, if we were being honest, it, it, it started off, our, Retreaty started off as a series of conversations with our friends in Mubanero in Rwanda and, and in Nicaragua. And um, we really, you know, didn't intend to start a company. We just wanted to make a printer that could um, uh, enable 3D printers to be in the communities we were in because we were finding that we were spending a lot of time and energy as NASA scientists, engineers, and astronauts getting this equipment um, imported into countries and then um, dealing with how it would be maintained and training people when the people we met were really brilliant. Um, sometimes there was high unemployment and they really wanted to problem solve independently. I come from a background in manufacturing in Detroit. My co-founder is a farmer from Iowa. So we, we started to look at bringing a printer in and what we learned is that people when they want to make functional things, they're usually like bigger than that desktop system. You know, they might be a lower limb prosthetic or a birthing stool or a composting toilet. So that's where we came up with requirements of making a toilet sized 3D printer. And then we learned um, through interviews, I was a social entrepreneur and residence for NASA headquarters that the pur purchasing threshold was often $10,000 um, for people to, to do quick procurement. So those were requirements that formed what would be this open source printer. We started applying to challenges, including home with Jack Daniels, where we a finalist in, and, and got a following, and that allowed us to get more user feedback. But for us, kind of like Tony, you know, we, we prototyped really quickly once we got the initial funding from Startup Chile. In just eight weeks, we made the first version of Gigabot, and we were just really blessed that Startup Chile had, or excuse me, South by Southwest had a Startup Chile booth there that year, and we launched it with Kickstarter the day of. I encourage you to launch your product at, at live events to get feedback besides your mom and, and your family. And, and then we learned that everyone that bought that printer was not our friends in Rwanda. They were Fortune 500s that were calling Kickstarter and saying, how do I set up an, an account to do a crowdfunding campaign to buy this? And those customers really guided us um, as, as we versioned up. So I think for us, you know, in the idea stage, it was just about getting it out there and, and getting feedback and then trying to be um, as responsive as we could to it. 
Samantha, it makes me think of how we find ways to pay for things when, like, Kickstarter would be way outside of government procurement. Um, but perhaps that's changed. Well, let's go to our third question. Um, how about commercialization? It's one thing to have a great idea and product. It's quite another to effectively bring it to market. And it sounds like we've already kind of peppered your, your com or the conversation with a little bit of this, but can you kind of expand a little bit on it? In the commercialization phase. And you know what? And um, Anthony, why don't you start? And then the next round, Samantha, I'll let you go. Okay. Um, so the going from having a prototype and a product that you think you can produce, there's also um, debugging it, like what Samantha had to do. Um, we, for the first year and a half, we just used our own money to uh, develop the system. Then we were lucky and we had gotten a, a DSPI program, which was part of CCAT from San Diego, to build six pre-production prototypes that um, first responders could, could try. Um, this coincided with some, uh, uh, some very serendipitous lucky press. Um, for some set of reasons, Popular Science had picked us as an invention of the year. And we had some YouTube videos. Uh, somebody had made a blog on Baywatch and had stuck our Emily robot into the Baywatch video. And that went viral to millions of people. And um, we had nothing to do with that. That was just some jokester did that. And our export, our, our first real orders, we had some trickle orders from places that had really bad situations with drowning. But um, that video carried over to Korea and to Indonesia. And um, within about a year of that video, we ended up doing over $2 million in sales to those countries. And uh, it was interesting, you know, their, their foreign accounts, they came, they paid cash, sometimes with a bag. And, um, but the, uh, so we didn't require financing to do the production runs. And it got us, it ramped us up into a volume so that when other people were interested, we were able to quickly uh, pull a product off the shelf and ship it to them right away. Um, so there are sometimes some, some of our customers just mail a check and they circle a page on the catalog and say, this is what I want. And, you know, it was completely unplanned for us. So uh, maybe 30% of our business comes that way. So we're, we're always building inventory to uh, ship for unexpected orders. Most orders though are, you know, they, they take a while to evaluate. Um, we're still experimenting with what type of marketing or what kind of sales will increase our sales. And um, so we're still in a sort of a shotgun approach, you know, with all different kinds of uh, 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 trials that we do, different places to advertise, different kinds of advertising, different types of social media. And uh, that, that seems to be a big challenge for us right now. So, um, so we're just doing it as a shotgun. And Samantha, how about the... Uh... It sounds like you guys have had such a fascinating, you know, trip as well. Yeah, Your so admittedly, you know, commercialization. Okay. Yeah, we, we were really lucky with, with that Kickstarter win in 2013. Um, but then, you know, then the real work uh, began once once the money hit the bank a couple months later. Um, admittedly, we ran uh, a Ponzi scheme for the first few years because our uh, advisors had encouraged us to go ahead and take pre-orders oh, no. while we were fulfilling our backlog <laughs> so that, um, you know, we had money coming in as we were standing up a factory. So we were really um, fortunate. Um, a friend, astronaut Ron Garin, had hooked us up with like a corner of the Lockheed Martin building to figure out how to do um, manufacturing and, and to have a place to ship and receive parts. We're also using Matthew's garage where he had a CNC, uh, the first one. And then there was a government shutdown that year. So a lot of our NASA peers and their kids came and helped us work on delivering orders. And I was in tech school at the Air Force. I'm an Air Force reservist. Um, at one point, uh, some of my teammates in tech school were helping me build gigabots from the shared apartments in the dorms. Um, but it, it was really, uh, you know, it was it was uh, it was a lot of work. We we weren't expecting, you know, to start a for-profit uh, venture with a factory. Um, but we are operational now. I put a link in here um, for uh, a virtual tour if you want to uh, sign up for a workshop or to check it out. And for us, though, in commercialization, you know, we we were able to figure out how to deliver, but 
with our technology, where the commercialization conundrum is, is um, you know people are quick to point out as you know Pam an additive the the field is evolving every day and the materials and the testing and the qualification and the ongoing customer support you have to deliver and when you're working on discounted salaries in the beginning it can be a real grind and and where we really around year three four started to struggle is recognizing that we had to invest resources into R and D but where is that going to come from and feature requests and our vision to print from trash. So that's when we um, started to get to know yourselves, U.S. Commerce, to leverage, you know, webinars through SBA, to really think about strategic scaling with manufacturing, getting in conversations around trade skills and standards. I'm pleased to see that NIST is on this because uh, you're a big piece of the puzzle. Um, but that's, so we heard about uh, the seed fund and, and got rejected the first go round, as, as do many, and, and learned from the feedback. And um, since I've had, uh, I think we've had seven SBIRs in, in three different agencies and, and have a couple pending, but. Um, from that, any, any phase two we've done, we've completed two, has led to a product that's in commercialization, and we've always been really transparent about our research journey. So uh, what we find is that many of our current customers or new customers will buy the product we're developing with the understanding it's in beta to give us feedback. So that, that open source lean, community-driven lead um, has really uh, benefited us in, in our domain so that uh, we could commercialize our product. And then um, along the way, we've leveraged opportunities like the STEP grant and other resources to learn how to ex export successfully, as well as to um, take advantage of resources to get out and to do uh, demos and markets that might be really expensive, like uh, Hanover Messe in, in Germany. Oh, great plug for the trade show that I spent a lot of time working on over the last several years. Um, I know the STEP grant is, is invaluable in partnering with, with the commercial service to get companies to some of these key trade shows around the world. Um, you know, I'm going to expand a little bit on the, the, as we turn towards your global expansion for both of your companies. You know, what resources did you tap along the way? It sounds like, you know, the STEP grant, um, working with the commercial service. Um, any great lessons learned, um, mistakes, stories, stories that you can share? Sure. Um, you know, at Re3D, we fail every day. We, we borrow the mantra from our time at NASA, fail forward, fail fast, fail frequently. I think I just put that out of order. Um, and, and, you know, every Friday, so I'll be teeing up tonight, our whole company shares a win, a kudos, and a fail of the week. A couple of our teammates call them lessons learned. Um, but just to go show, just to show you, the team of 22, we're all making at least 22 mistakes a week, or trying to figure out which one we want to confess to. Um, but in terms of um, scaling, you know, it's, it's tricky, especially right now. Supply chains are are really, it's it's tough. You know, there's unexpected challenges every day. Shipping rates are going up. Some of our products have a longer lead time, like these larger custom uh, versions of our system that might be 12 weeks to deliver. Well. Shipping may have been prepaid, and in that 12 weeks, you know, the shipping rate could have doubled or, or tripled, and, you know, that comes out of our bottom line, um, or the cost of certain components, or, you know, ships getting stuck in the Suez Canal or now in L.A. Um, in addition to that, you know, we are now just south of 60 countries. We're, we're working on closing the 60th now, so we can announce that milestone, but that means, um, you know, we've, we've had to overcome a lot of export issues. Um, and surprisingly, there's there's countries you can export to all the time that are your neighbors, like Canada and Mexico. <laughs> and then every other one, you you know, you find yourself in a new predicament, you know, the customs broker or some sort of paperwork. The classification codes for our industry are changing all the time, whether it's robotics, plastic machining equipment, or actually a 3D printer, which can um, complicate duty and how that's done. So we really, um, SBA and U.S. Commerce have had a phenomenal um, uh, amount of, like, uh, webinars and resources. We leverage them a lot. It was especially helpful during the PPP loan, too, and, and, and navigating um, all of that. But for us, um, we really leaned on our relationship with U.S. Commerce in addition to the STEP grant uh, to figure out how to export. And the best example I can give quickly is we, we may have, our first time we tried to export to Egypt, to New American University, um, found out uh, that our – our, our large freight crate with a printer in it um, had been confiscated by their version of the LES, the law enforcement, because it was declared a weapon of war, which is uh, a new one for me. So we had to work with U.S. Commerce to figure out how to get it undeclared as a weapon of war, which involved directly calling the, the embassy. And then finally, another resource that we haven't utilized yet, but for us to scale going forward post-COVID or whatever COVID is, is there's, there's resources um, through U.S. Commerce to actually 
be hosted by an embassy and they'll send out beautiful invites to invite strategics to come to the embassy and for you to do a, a live demo. And I think that resource in and of itself isn't exploited enough. Maybe exploited is also the wrong word. Um, by, by small businesses. Explored. Yeah, single Sorry, company explored. promotions, they're awesome. They are just an awesome tool for folks and the, the folks who have used them. And maybe Stephen can mention those a little later in his, his remarks. Um, Tony, your global expansion. Yeah, so, yeah, so for stories. So for us stuff, going to. Uh, we're gonna have to go soon. So for us um, going global or exporting was a completely new world. It was just as difficult as just simply commercializing. So um, we were lucky we had, there's some staff in the U.S. Commerce Service here in Arizona that helped us with how do we get our um, non-ITAR status of things and getting through PIS, um, getting our, our EAR99 products um, listed that way so we could export. Um, so that, that was the beginning. It took us quite a while to put together uh, the catalogs. Um, then we also took advantage of the, the STEP program and um, foreign support by the U.S. Commerce Service with embassies. Um, we found embassy application and interaction to be extremely helpful. Um, a lot of times foreign customers are nervous about if they send us money, will we cheat them, will we do nothing? And so having the credibility of the U.S. government say, hey, these are good guys was a real big plus. Um, we're also fortunate our state has been very supportive of our export activities. Um, there's so many different places where you can get help. And the trick is getting all of these places together and coordinating um, where each one has strengths. Um, for instance, our state has helped us with the cost of translating our brochures into multiple languages, along with cultural issues and as we travel to these places, we, we take iconic pictures so we can put it into their catalogs and their brochures. So we're in France, we're advertising boats in French locations instead of in you know Southern California. Um, the uh, agencies like the U.S. Commerce Service or and the Arizona um, Commerce Authority and the MEP, the Arizona MEP were really helpful in lessons learned that they heard from other people to get us those, that knowledge so we didn't have to uh, reinvent the wheel so many times. Um, delegation visits, I highly recommend. Um, the, uh, you go with a group of companies, um, we've done a number of those, but we usually do several a year, and some of the costs are offset, but the real value is being with a credible source and um, getting a lot more of attention. And also higher level um, entities tend to, uh, to come to your meetings or your demonstrations or your requests. Yeah, we, we find that it, it, it helps companies put, put their best foot forward. You know, you know your business and we're here to just help you um, help yourself. Um, you know what, I'm gonna be just in the interest of time, if you could just give us one piece of advice that you would recommend um, for a U.S. exporter? And um, I'm not sure if, Samantha, are you on? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, did I cut out? That's, that's okay, no, your video was off for a second. Um, why don't we start uh, with Samantha, and then um, just one piece of advice. We had sure, to boil yeah. it all down. Yeah, and, and Admiral once told me this was an exercise as a first lieutenant, or a second lieutenant, but I think you, he said, you know, you could be stupid for a day or stupid forever, so don't be afraid to ask questions. and. I think for U.S. manufacturers, as you export globally, you have a lot of questions. No one's an expert in everything, but, but U.S. Commerce, SBA, um, and a lot of the federal resources, they are SMEs, and they're here for you. So don't hesitate to ask them questions, visit the office, and, um, and to, to learn from their expertise. Thank you. Oh, Tony, what's your, that's a great piece of advice in just life, too. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Samantha. Um, on, Technical, my one thing I would, I mean, anybody who's watching this, they're, they're probably already accustomed to solving problems, but my advice is learn how to do social media within your organization. 
and it's not the same as social media for the U.S. Learn the cultural differences um, in other countries, because sometimes just a very small cultural adjustment can make the difference between your media having a strong, your social media having a strong impact overseas or having a negative impact, and you may not even be aware of it. So learn that cultural difference along with your, and be prepared to answer the phone at all hours of the day. Yes, and be on conference calls at all hours of the day too, but productive ones. We, you know, we could continue asking you guys for questions for a long time, and I know I, I because your stories are so fascinating, but just in the interest of time, we're gonna, tra we're gonna transfer over to um, our follow-up panel that's gonna elaborate on some of these resources. But um, stand by, Tony and Samantha, because we will possibly have some questions for you at the end in the, in the general Q&A. So what I'd like to do is um, introduce our panel of federal resources, federal agency programs and services for early stage manufacturers. And we're gonna start with um, the uh, SBA, the Small Business Administration, Steve Sullivan. We're gonna go next to um, NIST Manufacturing Extension Partnership, Scott Bryant. And then um, to my colleague um, with the US Commercial Service, Stephen Murray, who's based in our Pittsburgh office. Um, Steve, I'm gonna hand the, hand the floor to you. Thanks, Pamela. I'll try to go fast so we have some time for questions because I've seen a lot of great questions coming in. So hello exactly. all, I'm Steve Sullivan with SBA's Office of International Trade. Uh, Tony and Samantha both utilize the SBIR program to jumpstart their business. In fact, I, I believe Tony's in the Hall of Fame for that program. So I wanted to just kind of give you sort of a quick overview of that so you can walk away understanding it. The Small Business Innovation Research Program, SBIR, and Small Business Technology Transfer, STTR, are highly competitive programs that encourage small businesses to engage in federal resource research uh, with potential for commercialization. So the, the program has five key goals, uh, meet federal research and development needs, increase private sector commercialization of innovation derived from federal research, stimulate technological innovation, foster and encourage participation in innovation and entrepreneurship by women and socially or economically disadvantaged individuals, and foster technology transfer through cooperative R&D between small businesses and, and research institutions. Uh, so next slide, please. Wendy, next slide. So, so uh, in fiscal year 2020, federal agencies on this slide invested more than $4 billion in SBIR and STTR awards. Uh, SBIR, STTR budgets are a set percentage of these agencies' overall external R&D budget. The, the largest sources of SBIR and, SB, and STTR funding are, are Department of Defense at nearly $2 billion and Department of Health and Human Services at $1.2 billion. Uh, and the main difference between SBIR and STTR is that STTR awards have a requirement for a percentage to be done by nonprofit uh, research institutions. So next slide. So for, for local assistance, understanding and accessing uh, SBIR, STTR funding, please visit www.sbir.gov slash local assistance. Uh, so let's move on uh, from startup to growth. Next slide. So you may be thinking, I get it that SBIR is a great resource for early stage manufacturers, but are they ready to participate in international trade? Well, the answer is sometimes surprisingly yes, but more importantly, even for those not ready to start up global, they should be thinking about growth opportunities from day one. Uh, the global growth potential of these manufacturers was clearly illustrated recently when we cross-referenced our STEP grant client list with the SBIR graduate list and found more than 100 companies that had used both. So you've heard a lot of talk about the STEP grant, the State Trade Expansion Program, or STEP, is a grant program for states and territories to offer financial assistance to small businesses to help offset costs associated with exporting. A step helps small businesses that are either new to export or 
experienced exporters looking to expand into new markets. So you can see on the slide a variety of eligible uses for STEP funds. Prior to COVID, the most common use of STEP funds was to support travel to foreign trade shows and missions. Of late, we have seen uh, significant growth in training and e-commerce tools to support exporting. STEP can help companies build their e-store, globalize their website, develop cybersecurity measures to better protect their online transactions, et cetera. Uh, so for, please visit uh, www.sba.gov slash step for a list of participating steps or states uh, and to find contact information. So next slide, please. So with the, while the STEP grant is the main SBA international trade resource that we want you to be aware of today, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some others. We see three main reasons that small manufacturers don't export more. They don't know where to start, which is also applicable to current exporters finding new markets. They believe that the regulatory environment is too complex or they find it difficult to finance global sales. SBA has solutions to each of these. You see some links here. We're actually going to have a uh, webinar next week on, uh, on the financing. So, so between the business intelligence that we offer grants and financing, you're hearing about grants a little bit today. You'll hear about financing next week. Uh, and you can hit the links for more information on those programs. So next slide. I just want to leave you with the final slide to remind you of contact information for some of our various programs. You have the innovation resources on your left and the exporting resources on your right. Uh, down below in the middle is an additional link to connect with SBA district offices and resource partners. So small business development centers in particular can be great counseling resources for starting up and growing globally, and, and there you can find them on that link as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Bryant to talk about uh, Manufacturing uh, Extension Partnership and some of their services. Scott, all you. Got to unmute, Scott. I'm Scott Bryant. I'm out here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, we're enjoying our gorgeous balloon fiesta today and this entire week. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to uh, just cover a little bit uh, about the, let's say, the connections between uh, those who are working in the field um, literally coming down onto the manufacturing floor and connecting our, um, our manufacturers with programs through the partnership. So partnership including, of course, NIST, um, SBA, uh, our SBDCs are regularly um, used and partners in what we're doing. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so in to understand why the federal mechanisms become so important here, you have to kind of know more about New Mexico and its history. Uh, but in a state of 2 million people, uh, we have a actually a long history of manufacturing here, uh, but let's say that it's just not enough population density. So our markets are actually outside of New Mexico, and we have had to focus on building entrepreneurship and commercialization from that. That's what we do uh, in working with our um, emerging manufacturers and bringing them along. It is somewhat nurturing, but it is also connecting and networking. As you can see from the slide, our intention is to reach outside and pull resources into the state. Next slide. So, uh, you know, we deliver systems on the floor um, it's the fifth largest state uh, in the union with 2 million people, so it's quite a lot of outreach. The pandemic has been very interesting in terms of us being able to use uh, virtual uh, means to help uh, reach out across the rural areas. Um, more than 85% of our manufacturers are family-owned businesses, so we have that dynamic as well. When we bring in systems to uh, these kinds of organizations, that's also a little bit different. Next slide. These might be a, 
a decent list of things that we bring. Um, we also bring things under growth services that uh, tap into things like STEP. Um, we've used it uh, for a number of our companies because our model is to reach out and send our products outside of our state. Obviously, Intel is not interested in selling that many computers to New Mexico, except for a few special ones. And, um, and so our markets are outside. Um, so we've had to help uh, really work with um, uh, growth services in our companies, and the federal programs and our partnerships have been very, very, very uh, important to, uh, especially during the pandemic, um, accessing virtual trade shows, helping people reach out to markets, um, and even if the answer was kind of, nah, that's not a good idea, hey, that was uh, invaluable in terms of time not wasted. So we're a lot about waste. Um, with that, um, I encourage you, next slide, please. Um, we've got a wonderful example of a company. These were Intel employees that um, left Intel uh, in the downturn and uh, went out and became manufacturers. And, um, and the journey of this little company, which uh, does 3D manufacturing for pinball machines. Um, I found a great nation, wonderful story. And if you'd like to reach out to us, we do have, next slide, please. Um, we do have um, facilities, um, and we're definitely interested in partnerships and reaching out with um, connections in other states, particularly things like aerospace. Um, and, um, uh, happy to talk to you about uh, any of your companies that might need services, manufacturing services uh, from New Mexican suppliers. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Murray. Uh, and I'm with the Pittsburgh office of the U.S. Commercial Service. And as Pam mentioned uh, briefly before, we are the trade and investment promotion arm of the U.S. Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration. And I'll touch on who we are in a, uh, in a bit more detail shortly. But quickly, our primary role is to support U.S. companies to develop international markets. Uh, we do this through a global network of professionals located in more than 100 offices throughout the United States and in more than 75 international markets, typically with the U.S. embassies and U.S. consulates. Uh, we provide direct hands-on and virtual consultative work to help our clients identify potential markets, develop connections to protect prospective partners and customers, and to provide assistance on export-related issues. Um, what I want to stress is that we absolutely recognize the importance of startups to develop and bring innovation solutions to market, and the impact that startups, the impact that startups make uh, both locally and nationally. Uh, we also recognize that startups are typically very internationally minded. Uh, the need to grow and to scale carry startups beyond the U.S. market quite quickly, and that we, the U.S. Commercial Service, are here with information, uh, services, and resources for startups to plan at every stage for going global. We want to emphasize that startups cannot begin too early to think about international uh, and that a business does not have to be large to, to export. We can match our value proposition to each stage of the startup lifestyle, life cycle, from early stage of problem solution fit all the way through to the scaling and maturity uh, stages. Uh, so next slide. So what do we do? Uh, kind of quickly, you know, four kind of main uh, main areas. We provide counseling, so supporting companies by by helping them learn about exporting and international issues. Uh, two, uh, research to identify potential markets, so you understand uh, what markets might be good for you, what are the opportunities, and what are the challenges. Uh, three finding partners and customers. So this came up, I think, in the chat earlier. Uh, so we can help introduce you to reputable partners and co uh, customers overseas through our teammates, our colleagues at the embassies and consulates. Uh, and then we can provide commercial diplomacy. So in those instances where you need our support to interact with a foreign government, whether it's to advocate on your behalf for a for foreign procurement opportunity or if there's a market access issue. 
And so those are kind of the broad categories and maybe drilling down a little bit more uh, granularly, uh, you know, some of the things that we can do. So in terms of, of counseling and market research, you know, we can support your efforts to develop a, a global strategy through our counseling and through arranging market briefings with our colleagues overseas. Uh, we can help you to connect with buyers through international business missions and through our services such as the Gold Key, uh, which I labeled here as kind of the global partner and client acquisition icon. Uh, but we can connect you to foreign buyers, foreign customers. Um, uh, I noticed in the chat that somebody had brought up about how do you find trade shows. So uh, as Pam mentioned earlier, she is the leader for our advanced manufacturing team. The advanced manufacturing team is one of a number of industry-based teams that, uh, uh, that, that we operate with both domestically and internationally to provide very detailed counseling and direction based on industry verticals. So you could always reach out to, to one of my colleagues, depending on where you are, and, and, and plug into that to find out, you know, which trade shows would be a good fit with, for you. And then I've also mentioned in terms of the you know, kind of the commercial diplomacy, advo advocacy and forum projects uh, with foreign governments and then market access issues. Next slide. So when we look at our value proposition specific to uh, startups, we want to make sure that, that we're hitting what you need based on where you are within your life cycle. Uh, so at the early stage, we're not typically going to talk to you about business development efforts. What we're going to talk to you about is what are these big international uh, concepts, topics, issues that you should be aware of. You know, it's obvious. You know, it's a cliche to say you don't know what you don't know, but that really is the case. So what we want to do is to help you understand again, the big concepts related to international, so that you don't either back yourself into the corner or find yourself in a position where you're not really sure what to do. So we're happy to, to support companies with an understanding of regulatory issues such as export controls, uh, which Anthony mentioned earlier when he referenced either ITAR or EAR99. We want to help you understand what foreign regulations might look like for what you're doing, you know, as you kind of go through that ideating stage or as you're developing your, your MVP so you can kind of proactively account for those types of issues. So once you've kind of graduated past the, the, the early stage, so maybe you're a Series A company, uh, maybe you're you know, sitting uh, at that stage of product, or I'm sorry, market uh, solution and market fit, what we're there for what we're there for you then is to, to help you to start to make those connections. So finding, you know, potential channel, channel partners, finding market information, and helping find out which might be good markets for you. You may be receiving some leads already, so can we can help you with due diligence. So that company that's reached out to you for, from Korea, we can help get you some information on who they are and say so that you can make an informed decision as whether or not, whether or not they are a, a good fit for you. And we can start looking at some of our in-country support, so bringing our colleagues in from overseas for market briefings. You may be traveling, uh, so arranging a meeting for you uh, and just generally supporting you to get you all of that information that you need to put together your kind of go-to-market strategy. And so when you hit the, that later stage, so your scaling phase, you can really hit the ground running. And at that point in time, this is where we can really kind of bring our our real value add services to, to, to bear for to you. So that is connecting you to partners, finding those who are those core partners for you in each market. Uh, if you need very high profile, high value contacts, so there's a limited set of end users and you don't know how to get to them, we can help you make that approach. Certainly our trade missions uh, and then, you know, through our single company promotion, which is where we're doing kind of a branding event for you in country, we can help you to, to build your sales pipeline. Uh, and you can hit, you can interact with us. It's a continuum. So, uh, you know, whether you're early, mid, or late, we're certainly there to, to address export-related issues and provider counseling for you. So if, if you're beyond that, we're still there to work for you to, to again, help you understand the fundamentals of, of exporting and serve as a resource for you. Um, on my previous slide, uh, there is a link to, to help you find your, your local office. Uh, so again, there's roughly 100 of our offices throughout the United States, and we are there to support you every step of the way. So I appreciate everybody's time and, 
visit trade.gov for a, a bigger overview of who we are and, and, and what we do and, and a number of other resources designed to, to get you exporting effectively and efficiently. But thank you. Back to you, Pam. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, wow, we've had tremendous amount of content today. Um, we had some great questions. I would say that a lot of the questions were addressed in the federal resources section. So um, I'm just going to kind of wrap up a little bit. I know we're um, past the top of the hour, but I did want to throw one question out there. Um, you know, there was a question about step grants, and I know that's near and dear to the hearts of, of many exporters. And, and the question goes actually possibly to SBA, but, or perhaps to the, to the companies to comment, but what happens if the step grant funding in a, in a state has already been exhausted? Um, what other options might there be out there for companies to get to foreign trade shows or get some of the assistance with translations or? And Steve, I'm hoping that you can, or, or whoever would like yeah, to, uh, to take a stab at that. Yeah, I can certainly comment on that. I, I think the first thing you want to do when it, when it comes to step is make sure you're in contact with your state trade or step administrator to kind of find out what what's going on with uh, funds for next year, where where things are, see what the opportunities are there. Of course, we still have the pro we have our traditional SBA export finance programs that can support things from like uh, increasing your production capacity or or funds to participate in a foreign trade show or mission or, or, or any kind of marketing efforts. There are regular SBA supported loan programs that can support those. So those may be an option, but I would certainly go to your, uh, your step office, see where they are with things and, and then certainly tap into the U.S. Export Assistance Center because they may be aware of some things that, that you're not. Yeah, and that's great advice. I know some states get pretty crafty with, with other ways to, to supplement the STEP funds. I know with uh, uh, one state that um, they got, you know, money from another agency for, because it's ultimately we're here to create jobs and to help strengthen the U.S. economy. And so they found other ways to, to find some funding. So there's a lot of creativity going on out there. Um, you know, this makes me, you know, think also that um, all the partners here can help you find the other partners. So there's a few other questions, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna hand back over to Wendy. But just to, to impress upon everybody here that, that your speakers today, especially your federal resources, they can help connect you. If they're not the person, they know who the person is. And, and we're all one um, big ecosystem. And as well as our, 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 our featured panelists, as you can see, they, they started with one thing and learned about something else and, and, and kept being curious and asking questions. Just ask questions. People want to help. We're here to make a difference for you. You know your business. We help you get to the next level. Wendy, I'm going to hand it back to you. And um, I have been honored to, to work with this panel. I've learned a lot myself. Great, thank you, Pam. Once again, special thanks to Bailey DeReese, Associate Administrator, Office of Investment and Innovation, U.S. Small Business Administration, our moderator, Pam Plagens, Advanced Manufacturing Team Leader, U.S. Commercial Service, U.S. Department of Commerce, and to our businesses who participated. Anthony Mulligan, CEO, President, Hydronautics, and Samantha Snaves, Co-Founder, Catalyst, RE3D. Both fascinating business stories, and thank you for taking time from your busy schedules to join us today. As you exit the webinar, please complete the evaluation. Your feedback is important to us as it assists in planning future webinars, and just let us know any thoughts or any recommendations for future content. And remember, every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the month of October, we will feature a topic in celebration of manufacturers around the country to help grow your businesses. Thank you to all the attendees who joined today. This completes the webinar. Enjoy your afternoon. Enjoy your afternoon. Operator? Thank you. That does conclude today's call. Thank you for participating. Please disconnect at this time. Speakers, please allow a moment of silence for post-conference. <laughs>